There you are. Yes, you look beautiful. Um, nice to finally meet you. Light. It's nice to meet you too. So, um, so we go in two minutes. No, we're gonna go right now. Okay, great. <laughs> all right, you ready? Sure, you okay? Yep. All right. Hey, all right. So this is Brian Sebastian. Movie reviews and more. Women's broadcast TV network. Women on TV TV and IT two four seven out of Franklin, Tennessee, out of all places. And I've been waiting to interview this man for years. I mean, the last time I think I was this excited and I'd done this much homework was probably the first time I talked to Steven Spielberg. So in my mind, <laughs> on one when it comes to that. So this is Howard Booth. He's an author, one of the world's best publicists, if not the best publicist, 70s, 80s, and I still till this day uh, with groups like, you know, you can't let's see, Sticks. Uh, my God, Joe. Mike, Michael Jackson, Prince, Prince Bob Marley, Bob Marley Fiddler, ZZ Aerosmith, Top, Kiss, uh, Run DMC. Peter Gabriel, Billy Joel, Buzz Aldred, who I had the pleasure of meeting. We'll get into science later. Uh, Joan Jett, ACDC, Kiss, Queen, one of my favorite bands and one of the best uh, concerts I've ever seen in my entire life. Billy Idol, Sherry, ZZ Top, and the list goes on and on and on. Howard, to that. And without further ado, we have Sherry Nelson out of British Columbia. Sherry, hi, where are you? <laughs> you've, you've disappeared on the Zoom. Okay, so uh, since Sherry, I can't hear Sherry or see Sherry, um, why don't we get going? So tell me what you'd like to discuss and we'll go Mr. in any direction you want. Oh, Sherry, there you are, yes. Uh, Mr. Bloom, uh, you, as Brian mentioned, you've represented the greatest acts of several decades and their longevity seems to still stand the test of time. I know that oftentimes for us to find our magic, it takes an outsider to look inside of us. And you had mentioned that um, even back in the 70s and 80s, you would meet an artist and you would research and research and then you found the essence of their soul and that is what you magnified is that what you still believe to be you know the secret to success for people in the spotlight i think it's missing in today's art and I, and, and i think that's a terrible tragedy because uh, i used to do what i call secular shamanism so if you came into my office and you wanted to be my client i gave you a little lecture and I said, look, if you want me to fashion an artificial mask for you, an image, and sit back like a guy in a plaid checkered suit with a big cigar in his hand and say, with this image, kid, I'm gonna make you a star. I'm gonna send you to my best competitor. You'll be in his office in two hours. If you wanna work with me, you have to understand something. Um, music is not an exchange of pieces of plastic. Music is not an exchange of downloads. Music is not an exchange of money. Music is an exchange of human soul. And if we're going to work together, I, I am going to look for the very soul of you. I'm going to look for what I call the gods inside of you. What do I mean by that? You sit down, you've got an album deadline coming up. You sit down at two in the afternoon in front of a blank computer screen or a blank piece of paper to write a lyric you know with absolute certainty you cannot write a lyric. You have no idea of how you've ever written a lyric in the past. And two hours later, there's a lyric in front of you. And once or twice in your life, that lyric is so perfect, it felt like it wrote itself through you. My job is to find the soul inside of you, the gods inside of you that wrote those lyrics for you. You go on a stage on a good night, you see the pupils of the audience dilating. You see their eyes widening. You see their faces melting. You see them coming together as one collective blob, like an amoeba of energy. You feel it reach a pseudopod, reach a pseudopod out to you. And the, the energy of that audience, 700 people or 70,000 people, comes coursing through you as if you were an empty pipe. You have an out-of-body experience. You feel you're on the ceiling watching this all take place. You see that energy go up to an area around your head become utterly transmogrified and flow back out through your body to that audience and you see their eyes growing even wider and the feedback loop just keeps going. And you feel like you are being danced like a marionette, like a puppet on the stage. And when you get off stage, it takes you an hour to come back to your normal, normal hello, how are you, fine, thank you very much self. My job is to find the gods that danced you on stage do that i'm going to study everything you've ever written every album cover you've ever put out every interview you've ever done for six weeks then i'm going to come out to see you in your element in the place that reflects you the most 
We are going to sit down for at least one day with no managers, no assistants, no wives, no intercessors of any kind. It's just you and me. And my job is secular shamanism. My job is to deep, dig and dive so deep into you that we find the soul inside, that we find God's inside. And I used to preach to my artists that you don't just owe your audience your songs, you owe your audience your life. And Sherry, I knew it was true. I just didn't know what it meant. It took me 20 years to figure out what it meant. And what it meant was exactly what you said. Many of these artists, Prince, Bob Marley, Bette Midler, have become immortal. And they've become immortal for a simple reason, because my job was to find the soul inside of you that your audience could sense. When people put posters of you on their wall, when they hit the age of 12 or 13, you became trellises on which they would grow. Do you know what a trellis is? It's if you ever tried to raise tomato plants, tomato plants have stems so weak that they flop. And the result is the tomatoes are on the ground and the tomatoes rot. So you put up a wooden framework and you tie the tomato plant to it and the tomato plant learns to grow. And the plants are, the, the tomatoes are in the open air and no longer rot on the ground. Well, kids grow on the posters on their wall, on the people those posters represent, the way that tomato plant grows on a trellis. You become their role model. And your soul, getting your soul across to that audience means everything in the world because it's going to determine the nature of the lives of the, those kids for the rest of their lives. Um, nobody is doing that in the entertainment industry today. Nobody's doing it with actors and actresses. Nobody is doing it with singers. Nobody's doing it with anybody. And so uh, there's a false vocabulary being used in the entertainment industry. People are talking about markets and marketing and, and uh, image and um, branding. And all of these are false terms. They're false terms because no matter what you're selling, even if you're selling McDonald's hamburger, you are selling something that your fellow humans deeply crave, that they deeply need. Your, those fellow humans are not a market. They are not inanimate robots. Um, they are human beings, and you are feeding their desires. You are feeding their aspirations. You are feeding their highest needs. Um, and you have to understand that. You have to stop dehumanizing the people that you're working with, and you can't call what you do product. I'm sorry, it's not product. These are the most extraordinary statements of your soul moving through you and expressing itself in spite of you sometimes and then flowing out to your audience who also have soul. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand the nature of the industry that you're in. So the result has been that people like Britney Spears, we don't know their souls. Um, people like Maroon 5, we have no idea of their soul. The people around them are concentrating on, sending, on setting up ginger ale promotions and, uh, and automobile sponsorships and things that are gonna make hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, but are going to utterly destroy our sense of who these people are and steal from us the possible property of being able to grow on these people by finding what is best and most astonishing and alive inside of them, the gods inside of them that can call out to the gods inside of you and me and give us validity and give us a sense of identity. Does that make right. any sense? As you say that, as you were saying that, that applies to a lot of people, if not everybody, but specifically, I was thinking of Prince, of you me oh, yes. being in that closet, of what you just said, your message has not changed since you said that to him, has it? No, it hasn't changed a bit. Um, it's still the missing element in all of the commerce. I wrote, look, in 2002, I think it was, it looked like the, the world was falling apart. Um, we'd had 9-11 and Enron, World they were all collapsing, giant corporations. And I went to my mentor in neuroscience, because remember, I've been published in, published or given scholarly lectures at scholarly conferences in 12 different fields, from theoretical physics, that is uh, quantum physics and cosmology, to evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, information science, aerospace, you name it. I've been published or have given scholarly lectures in those fields. Um, but I went to my mentor in neuroscience, a guy named Ted Coons, who discovered what the hippocampus, or the hypothalamus does. And I said, Ted, I, I've got a choice of writing two books. 
I can write a book called The Big Bang Tangle, Quarking in the Social Cosmos, Notes Short of Post-Newtonian Science that I've been working on for a long time now, or I can write a book to save Western civilization. Which should I write? And Ted said, you've got to write the book to save Western civilization. So I wrote a book that's now, that was originally called Reinventing Capitalism, Putting Soul in the Machine. It's now called The Genius of the Beast, A Radical Revision of Capitalism. And it says you have to use this approach in every field, whether you're selling automobiles, whether you're selling tires, whether you're selling a cereal to kids. No matter what you're doing, you have to understand that you are interfacing with the desires, with the most profound emotions of your fellow human beings. And if you don't understand that, you're robbing not only your audience of a sense of meaning, you're robbing yourself of a, self of a sense of meaning. Because when you go home and work at night, you have to feel that you did something meaningful on behalf of your fellow human beings, that you sustained them, that you uplifted them, that you empowered them in new ways somehow. And if you don't feel that, you feel empty at the end of the day. I mean, even if you're working at McDonald's, um, you, you, you interface with 200 or 300 people a day. And those interactions are precious. You have a choice. Do you regard yourself as being manipulated by the giant capitalist system and thus greet every one of those 300 people with a scowl? Or do you recognize that these are your fellow human beings that in serving them, if you can serve them with a smile, you might light up their day. You might lift them just a little bit. If you take the lifting other people approach and smile at those fellow human beings, you go home satisfied at the end of the day. And which is more important, your paycheck or your satisfaction? Both are important, but your satisfaction is the one indispensable, really hard to get ingredient. And you get that by knowing that you are serving as a secular savior. You are in some way, in some tiny way, uplifting and upgrading your fellow human beings or at the very least sustaining them. Now, look, when, when I started to work with Joan Jett, she had been turned down by 26 record companies. It looked as if she could never get a record deal in her life. And I mapped out a strategy and I said to her manager, look, you do what I do, work 17 hour days, seven days a week. And if you do everything I tell you to, we will have a star in two years. I knew that we had hit on, she had recorded an album in Sweden. Um, she was bigger in Europe than she was in the United States. And that's an understatement. And on that album, there was a hit. I love rock and roll. And I knew that we had a blanket the country with touring dates. Um, for the next year to the best of our ability so that the, her audience would know her and love her by the time that hit came. Otherwise, she'd become a one-hit wonder and would disappear in, instead of becoming what she deserved to be, which was an icon. Now, the point of the story is the, is the definition of secular salvation. If Joan Jett's I Love Rock and Roll came on, well, let, let me give you a little background first. There was a beeper study done back in the 1980s when beepers were brand new. And what they did was beat people every 15 minutes and they had them write down their emotional state. And, it, and they were trying to demonstrate that kids have more turnover in their emotional states than adults. What they ended up demonstrating was something different. Um, adults go through seven major mood swing cycles a day, meaning seven times a day you cycle from heaven into hell. And then if you're lucky, back into heaven again. And if you're not lucky, you never cycle back into heaven. You just go through various cycles of hell. If you hear Joan Jett's I Love Rock and Roll on the radio and it grabs you by the gonads, that lifts you out of that hell for three and a half minutes. That is secular salvation. If you go, if, if you go to Netflix and you pull up Robert Redford's version of The Great Gatsby, and which I worked on, and you and you watch it with fascination for 70 minutes. That's 70 minutes being lifted out of your personal hell. That is 70 minutes of secular salvation. And that is what entertainment offers to people. And it's one of the most, uh, I'm an atheist, but it's one of the most godly, it's one of the most divine things that you can offer to your fellow human beings. Does this mean you have the capacity to do divine things? You sure as hell do, because nobody else is going to do them. If there is no God, it is our job to do his or her work, period. You know, Sherry, you know, when he said that, and Howard, you'll love this. My roommate became a Joan Jett fan. He painted his whole car. He had one of those pacers. I love rock and roll on one side. I love Joan Jett on the other side. He was a, Amazing. He was a wacko. 
and he drove yep. it back and forth to school. He got on the top when she came to Hartford, Connecticut, took right. a car and sang and banged his car in I Love Rock and Roll and destroyed his car to that song. I never forget. Well, how PG do we how PG do we have to be? I want to tell you a Joan Jett story, um, but it's not PG. Um, I, I was working for a, a year or two with one of the major science writers in Holland. This brilliant, brilliant guy had great fun working with him. But he was twenty years younger than than I was. And one day we were conversing, you know, on our cell phones. I was out on the street walking around, and he was back in Holland. And and uh, I explained to him that when Joan Jett would do a photo shoot, her manager would send over roughly 3,000 slides to me in slide sheets. And I would go into a tiny room with no, and turn off all the lights except the overhead light and sit there with a magnifying glass going through the photos, every single wow. photo. And what was I looking for? I was looking for photos that you would want to put up on your wall if you were 11 and a half or 12 years old and your hormones were just beginning to flow. And I wanted you to masturbate to that picture. Why? Because if you did, Joan Jett would be one of the backbones of your life for the rest of your life. And she deserved to be, Brian. She lived for her art. She lived to go on stage. She lived to lift you out of yourself. Um, and uh, my, my partner from Holland said, well, it worked. So... <laughs> I find that so interesting because I know that um, you had specifically focused on the hypothalamus, which is the regulatory um, right. body right here that regulates, you know, our hormones. Oh, wow, Sherry, like you're on top of things. I'm you, impressed. <laughs> and there you come, Mr. Bloom, and you're trying to deregulate that hormone. So I think, I guess that is where you separate yourself as the master to the student in, in your endeavors in that music industry. And not to mention the hippocampus, which is where the memory and emotional memory lies and the limbic system, which is where your emotions are. And it's in that connection between the limbic system, your emotional system, which is deep down in the brain and is very animal-like. It's called the reptilian brain. It's that connection with the higher brain, your human brain, your prefrontal cortex, all of your cortex. It's in that connection that divinity lies. And, and what I was after divinity. I was after giving you secular salvation. Uh, I, it was after giving it to, you already had it when you were on stage, if you were a star, you already had it when you did that writing that came to you as if you were a puppet um, on your lyrics and your melodies. Um, you just didn't know it. And you needed somebody who could remind you of who you were. For example, one day John Mellencamp called and he said, I've just been at, at, offered $1.25 million to do uh, uh, to let Heinz Ketchup use my song, Hurts So Good, for a ketchup commercial. Now, remember how hard it was to get ketchup out of the bottle, that those glass bottles before the squeeze bottle was introduced? You had a bang on it. You had to shake it up and down. And still, a half an hour later, it hadn't come out and your hamburger was cold. Um, but the, so, so the... Very clever marketers had come up with uh, using Carly Simon's anticipation to make a positive out of that negative. Now they wanted to use John Mellencamp's Hurt So Good to make a positive out of that negative. And uh, John said, what do you think? And I said, John, what do you want to be in 15 years? Do you want to be making music in front of your fans? Or do you want to be clipping coupons? Do you want to be just uh, living off of the uh, earnings from your investments? And John said, I want to be making music. And I said, okay, then you have to turn down the ketchup commercial. And I explained it to him this. You are, imagine a giant city like Jerusalem was in the days of Isaiah with big, big city walls. And you are locked out because this is what happens to you when you're 12 or 13 years old. You begin to individuate. You feel locked out of everything. Um, and John, you stand there outside the gates, outside the walls of this huge city, and you lift your fucking fist in the air, and you say, I have a right to exist. I have an identity. Um, and you say that not just on behalf of yourself, you say that on behalf of hundreds of millions of people. If you accept that catch of commercial, it's like stepping through the gates of the city and dining with the big shots inside. 
you no longer are able to authentically make that statement on behalf of your audience. So if you want to lose that, take the ketchup commercial. If you want to continue to be who you are, and not just who you are, but who 100 million other people are and need to see reflected in you, then screw the ketchup commercial. And John turned down the ketchup commercial and I just learned in the last 12 months, it's why his manager quit. It's why his manager, Bill Yaff, who also managed Rod Stewart, left John um, over that ketchup commercial. Well, I'm sorry, Bill Yaff was wrong. And, and, and I, okay, this sounds really egomaniacal, but I was fucking right because I had, what was my role? To remind John of who he was for precisely the reason that you just articulated. Because sometimes you need somebody else to step in your life, into your life who can see you from the outside and see even deeper into you than you can see and help you stay true to yourself. Well, you know what, Sherry, which is interesting about that, now I understand why a lot of rock bands said no to commercials. You just, Howard, you just explained my reasoning why I couldn't figure out why they didn't take it, which was the reason why you should not take it. Thank you for that. Right. Tell me about that all these so, years. E even more, um, the, the practice of getting commercial sponsorship for rock bands was just starting in the mid 80s. And I was really against it. However, I knew the guy who was behind it. He was a genius. He was amazing at setting up these commercial deals. I just hated those commercial deals. So the two of us went on the Today Show together. They, they, the Today Show wanted me to comment on it. And I said, why don't you get Jay Coleman as well as me? Because he's the guy setting up the deals that you want to talk about. So Jay and I went on the show, sat on a couch together, um, were interviewed by Brent Gumbel, gave absolutely opposing points of view. It was one of the greatest pieces of, uh, of display, um, uh, of publicity that Jake Coleman ever got. Um, and, but, but you just, yeah, you got it. The, if Maroon 5, which I thought back in two, look, I was in bed for 15 years with a serious illness. When I got out of bed, um, the world was new to me. The world was the world had moved on over 15 years from what I was accustomed to. And one of the things I discovered was that wherever I went on the speaker systems, Maroon 5 was playing. And I always thought, wow, is this some Prince tune that I didn't know? And it always turned out to be Maroon 5. They they were absolutely terrific. And um, the the leader of that band could I could have do, do, dove in it, dived into the soul of the leader of that band and helped make him an icon because he deserved to be an icon. But no, instead he got commercial sponsorship after commercial sponsorship after commercial sponsorship and he means nothing to his audience. He means nothing to his audience and he means nothing to himself except his money. That's a sin. That is an absolute sin and it's being performed every single day in our culture. The artists are being deprived of knowing who they are and, and being who they are to the nth degree, and the audience is being deprived of knowing who they are and using them as a tool of growth. You know, it's funny. I think of this book, Einstein, Michael Jackson, and me, and there's so many great things in here. Um, again, I'm going back to Prince in that closet, you and Prince in that closet, before Paisley Park, if I remember correctly, Yes, Talk about absolutely. what that was like sitting down with him because not a lot of people ever got a chance to sit down with what you did. And well, here's here's what happened. Stay in the I, time I, and vanity and right. all the people he sent to you after that. Right. So basically, I read the trade papers. There were three music trade papers in those days: Cashbox, Billboard, and Record World. Right. And uh, and I'll tell you the story of that picture if you want. Um, that's in the center. So uh, I was reading these things religiously and I saw uh, an album moving up on the black charts. And then I saw that album go platinum. And, and I had never heard of this artist before. And I wondered who the hell he was, but obviously he was doing something significant. Then I got a call one day saying, you're working with Earth, Wind & Fire and Earth, Wind & Fire's manager, Bob Kavala, would like you to work with Prince. Well, Prince was that unknown artist who had gone platinum. And I was eager to work with Prince. There was obviously something important going on here. But I made the set of demands that I just told you. 
And I got a call from Warner Brothers Records on the West Coast from an extremely articulate Harvard level publicist who said, you're gonna have a big problem working with Prince. He can't do interviews. We set up two interviews for him. He said absolutely nothing to one of the interviewers and he tried to strangle the other interviewer. So um, I, you know, I had made my demand. I got to meet Prince in his own setting and I got to spend at least a day with him with nobody else around. And they, they said yes to that demand. So they flew me up of all places to Buffalo, New York, which is not Prince's territory. Prince's territory is Minneapolis. That's my hometown. Um, but Prince was rehearsing in the Shea Theater where I'd go on when I was 11 to see a movie um, for the Dirty Minds tour. So by then I had done all the research that I just told you about. Prince's lyrics were astonishing. I mean, they were the most sexually explicit lyrics I had ever encountered in my life. And I thought they were, they were just terrific. Um, and, um, I sat in the, you know, in the empty audience, in the empty auditorium, uh, watching while the band rehearsed. I was astonished because I, I had heard of black rhythm sections, but I'd never seen a white rhythm section for a black performer before, much less a Jewish rhythm section for a black performer before. And that's what Prince had. Um, and then we went backstage and we found a room that we could lock and we sat there for nine hours. And I got the story of his life out of him. And it was amazing. It was absolutely terrific. I mean, for example, we all have imprinting points. There are certain points in our lives where our brain opens to a certain kind of thing, a certain kind of stimulus. And once it finds it, it locks onto it and the brain carries that for the rest of your life. It literally changes its morphology to work around that piece of, th piece of memory that and it holds. And uh, one of those imprinting points happens at around the age of five. So I asked Prince, what's your first memory being interested in music? And Prince said, well, um, my dad was a jazz musician and my mom took me to see one of his rehearsals one day. And we sat in this theater and it was an, it was an empty theater like the Shea Theater that was out, out of the room, outside the room we were talking in. Um, and, and 500 seats all pointed at a center point on the stage imply attention. And he saw his dad in the spotlight and he said, I saw five of the most beautiful girls I'd ever seen in my life behind him. And that was it. Um, intense attention and sexuality are the things the brain is looking for, for its imprinting points. At that point in your life and again at around the age of 12 or 13, all over again. So that was it for Prince. It was the combination of sexuality and attention. And that story was the key to Prince. Then there was another story that was a key to Prince. Um, when he was in high school, but Prince, I, it took me a long time to register this, Brian. I thought Prince was my height. Um, and I'm tiny. I'm five foot five. But it turns out Prince was closer to five foot two or less. It took me three or four years to realize that because his personality was so big. So, but imagine you're a black kid, you're five foot two, you're in a school, you know, it's, it's mixed race. You're going to get the hell pummeled out of you. Um, you're going to be humiliated, you know, every single day. Um, so Prince had a friend, Andre Simone, Andre Simone's mother had a, a fixed base, a, a fixed up basement that nobody ever used. And if Prince did his homework, she let him use the basement. So Prince assembled a society in that basement, and it was based on the principle of make love, not war, which is something I had helped establish back in the 1960s when I had accidentally helped found the hippie movement. But that's another story for another time. So Prince created an alternative society in that basement where the rule was live out your sexual fantasies, period. And if you do, then Ronald Reagan won't be able to take us into a nuclear war. That was the basic philosophy. And that colored, I mean, when Prince put Paisley Park together, Paisley Park was the fantasy from that basement on a big scale, um, complete with the kinds of visual fantasies that Prince had had surrounding that. So finding these two stories was finding the essence of Prince up to that point. And then, now remember, when I started with Prince, Prince was unknown, period. He claimed he was 19, he was probably 23, but he was a 19 year old out of Minneapolis that nobody had ever heard of before. And we built him up to be a superstar. And then something happened inside of him. 
and to explain what happened inside of him, how the gods inside of him changed, you have to understand the story from John Cougar Mellencamp. So one day, John Cougar Mellencamp and I, I was doing my, my secular shamanism thing, soul finding, and what I explained to you was, your soul is gonna change. As you grow older, you're going to change dramatically. The way you once changed from a baby to a toddler and a toddler to a teenager and a teenager to a young adult. That's how severe these changes are gonna be. And as you change, the gods inside of you are going to change. So I need to come back every year and do this all over again to find out who you are now, who those gods inside of you are now. Well, I found that out the hard way with Prince because um, for, for seven years, we built Prince up to be this massive international superstar, like Purple Rain. Purple Rain was a film that Warners was gonna can. And I went into a conference with Warners and said, if you can this picture, you'll be committing crime against the history of popular entertainment. Because once upon a time, the Beatles came to America and they had the audacity to do something nobody had ever done. Up until then, singers had been given songs written in Tim Pan Alley to sing, and their producers had told them exactly how to sing it, and it even altered their voice in the studio to make it sound like they could hit the high notes, um, and then it had told them how to dress and where to sit in the movie theater. The Beatles took that all over themselves, and they wrote their songs. It was a first. And, they, and writing their own songs gave them the ability to make statements that no Tin Pan Alley songwriter could ever have made uh, with an authenticity that no Fabian or artificial star could ever convey, have conveyed. Prince is doing that with film. He is the first musician to make a movie that he, in essence, has written, produced, and directed by himself. And it is one of the most powerful emotional statements I have ever seen in my life. To succeed, a movie has to get you with a tear in your eye and with a lump in your throat. A, a movie has to get you so emotionally that you don't want anybody to see you when the lights go up because you don't want anybody to see your face because it's not the face you try to show to people. It's totally distorted by just deep, uncontrollable emotion if the film works. And this film does that. It ranks 110 on the tear in the corner of the eye and the lump in the throat meter. And killing this film will be killing a part of Now, and now Howard, I'm gonna interrupt you for and a minute lecture, there. Along with now, some brilliant work by his. Now, yeah, yep. sure. Now I had heard this for years that someone saved Purple Rain and so I didn't know it was Howard. I just knew it was someone. And I knew what those Warner Brother people were like uh, because I had to deal with them on a whole nother thing. But it was interesting that I thought it was brilliant of you, Howard, to have those three reviewers go down to San Diego, not tell anybody, and watch that movie and have them write their own thing. Kudos to you for doing that because your know, Purple Rain out there was made for $1 million and it made $80 million. Now, Sherry, if Howard hadn't saved this movie. Right, exactly. Well, it wasn't just me, it was Bob Cavallo. Bob Cavallo, Prince's manager, was a miracle worker. It, eventually, once Prince, Prince fired us all around 2007 or 2008, um, and we'll go into that story in a minute because it's a very important story about how the gods inside you change. But Bob Cavallo went on to be the head of Buena Vista Music, which is Disney's music operation. And the music industry was, that is the recording industry was going into the toilet at the time. And that operation was losing Disney a half, a $500 million a year, um, an incredible amount of money. And Disney decided they were gonna sell it. And Bob said, went to them and said, please do not sell this, just give me a year to show you what I can do. And Bob turned that operation around from a $500 million a year loss to zero loss, and then a $250 million profit and then a $500 million profit. Bob Cavallo is a miracle worker. So it wasn't just me, it was a team. Um, it was Bob Cavallo, me, and Prince himself. And here's what happened with Prince. Um, he was playing at Nassau Coliseum. I live in Park Slope, Brooklyn, in New York City. And uh, that's just a short cab ride away from where I am, a 45 minute cab. So I went out to see him to see what his latest show was like, what his latest tour was like. Well, the lighting was brilliant. Everything was brilliant. His dancing was brilliant. His dancing was too spontaneous to call dancing. It was a spontaneous movement. It was astonishing. 
Chris is one of the most astonishing performers I have ever seen in my life. But a strange thing happened. At one point, Prince went down on the stage and started humping it. Okay, that's normal, Prince, right? And then suddenly his body went still. And his body stayed still, and it stayed still, and it stayed still. And that feeling of magic in the audience that does allow you to be part of a collective energy was disappearing. We were becoming aware of the people behind us and the people on either side of us think we were cool and we were getting upset. We were thinking, oh my God, he's had a heart attack. Somebody's got to rush up and save him. And then suddenly six stories above our head, because this is a very high auditorium, a very high uh, uh, stadium, um, a voice came out of the ceiling. And the voice was the voice of God. And it was talking to Chris. Now the John Mellencamp story is this. John sat me down in his living room when I was going on one of these annual soul searching expeditions with John. And he showed me two films, HUD and Cool Hand Loop. And he explained HUD is the story of a young guy whose father rich. He owns a big white Cadillac in the days when Cadillacs were the length of three cars today. Um, and every day he goes into town, he goes to the local bar, he picks up board housewives, and you can imagine what he does with the board housewives. And of course, they're all beautiful because this is a movie. Um, then he goes back home again to his rich dad. Well, his rich dad is rich because he's a cattle rancher. And one day the state authorities come to his dad and say, look, there's hoof and mouth disease in your neighborhood. And to keep it from spreading, we're gonna have to kill your herd. Well, your herd, if you're a cattle rancher, is your 401k. Your herd is your life savings, period. Your herd is what makes you wealthy. Your herd is what allows you to buy a kid a white Cadillac convertible. Um, so HUD doesn't want to lose the family wealth. And he hatches a scheme to steal the cattle in the middle of the night and sell them someplace else, which of course, if there's hoof and mouth disease, would spread the hoof and mouth disease all over the United States. And then he has a crisis of conscience. He remembers the words of his father and he calls off the plan. Now, what John explained was, first you rebel against your father, then you, you become, become your, father. your father. Yes, and that's what was happening to Prince. The voice of God was beginning to appear in Prince's head. That was the voice of Prince's father trying to break through. So then I had another call a few months later from Bob Cavallo saying, we got a problem here, you gotta come out here immediately. And I came out and they said, look, Prince, I knew Prince had been making a movie in France. Uh, we all, in order to get anybody involved with Prince, we had to call France for a year. Um, and now, the, and, and oh, Under the first, cherry moon. Bob called, yeah, Bob called first, I forgot to tell you this, and said, look, we finished the movie, you gotta come out and see it. Um, so I flew out and it was shown at one of those theaters for 600 kids and they all have a little dial um, on the, the arm of their chair. So they can dial when, here when it's good and here when it's bad. Um, hey Howard, I'm gonna stop you right there because we got about 60 seconds and we're gonna come back and do part two. Give you a website really quickly. Powerbloom.net. Hey, so for Brian, and and this is movie reviews and more see this book this is one of the best books i've ever written oh not to say written i've ever read in my entire life and i read a lot of books so for that we're going to come Thanks, back Brian. with part two uh this is movie reviews and more women on tv.tv for sherry and elsa will be right back <laughs>